Merry Christmas, motherfuckers. Yo, what's up, motherfuckers? This be Michael Myers here. I'm here to introduce that bitch Tim's Christmas special this year. We couldn't get Santa Claus, but we got the best thing. Me, motherfucker. Michael Myers, the big M, the G unit. And I'm here to introduce Tim's Christmas special. His 69, baby. That's right, 69 favorite horror films. Take that shit back. As you can see, I'm wearing my regular day attire. Not really in killing mode today. So I'm kind of just wearing my casual wear. So this is me on just a regular day. So if you don't like it, fuck you. But let's jump into this 69 shit while we add it. Hello everybody, this is Tim here. Just to jump into my 69 favorite horror films video. Now these are my personal 69 favorite horror films, so they don't have to be so much, you know, the greatest horror films ever made. These are just films or horror films that's appealed to me in different ways that I've really enjoyed. We'll just go ahead and jump into the first film here, Critters. Now these films are in no order, just random. So just to jump into the first film here, Critters. I think Critters is a B-movie classic. I, uh, for me it is. I love Critters. Uh, it's just so much fun. Some people think it's a rip-off of Gremlins. I really don't think so. I think the scripts for both films were being written around the same time. Gremlins just got happened to be made first, and Critters got happened to be made later. But as far as the films, uh, as far as the films go, the the way the Critters look don't really resemble Gremlins uh, that much to me. Just the look of them and the design are different. And uh, the critters use these like these use like these little fucking quills on their back to shoot in the people to cause them to pass out and everything. And I thought that was really neat. That's a that's a lot different than the characters of Gremlins. But in the Gremlins films though, you do get them using uh, fucking uh <laughs> well you do get like montages is what I was trying to say. Both of the critters and Gremlins in both of their films like tearing shit up. And <laughs> I thought that was uh. <clears throat> That was a little bit uh, much. That was a little bit too close to Gremlins. But other than that, uh, this film is a lot different from Gremlins, at least to me. And I really enjoy this film. I just think it's a lot of fun. I think if you're a fan of horror B films, that uh, you'll get a uh, you get a really fun time out of this film. I just love the characters and I love the '80s rock song in the film. It's the power of the night. <laughs> this film is just so much fun. I just get a kick out of it. Uh, to the characters like Charlie and the Bounty Hunters, I just have a lot of fun with them. I will say that the ending of Critters 2 with the giant critter ball is better than the ending here with the one giant critter. But I will say that this film is more uh, is a tighter film and uh, better written than Critters 2. Um, I don't really care too much for Critters 3 and 4. And in my opinion, if any franchise needs the Halloween H2O treatment, it's this one. I would love to see a film that ignores Critters 3 and 4 and just takes place after 2. But that's just me. But, uh... As far as this franchise goes, I don't want to touch on a lot of these movies too much because I want to save to talk. I want to talk about them more when I get to their own reviews. But just to uh, finish up on this film here before I jump into the next film, this film's a lot of fun, and uh, I definitely recommend that you watch it. The characters are really likable. The film has a really down-to-earth feel with uh, with the family in the film. Um, you actually get Billy Zane in a fucking uh, one of his first roles in this film, who dies pretty early on in the film. <clears throat> So that's fun, watching Billy Zane croak, the asshole from Titanic. But uh, but yeah, this is still a really fun film with a really fun creature design and good makeup effects and good creature effects for its time. Um, and uh, and for, in my opinion, this is another film that shows practical effects will always be number one. So <laughs> the reason one of this film is on here is because I really enjoyed this film from when I was a kid. And I still have a blast watching it today, and I think the characters are really enjoyable, and I think they still hold up today. And I would just like to say that another reason why this film obviously makes my list is because it has one of my favorite scenes in horror film history, where the fucking uh, the critters are like outside of the house, and uh, the uh, fucking uh, she uh, the mom in the film she gets a gun, and the critters are standing out there. I believe it's D Wallace. It's been a while since I've seen it. And she fucking gets like a shotgun and then one of the critters is like, should we go in after her or something like that? And uh, the other one's like, but they have weapons. And the other one goes, so? And then she fucking sticks a shotgun out there and blows one of them like to pieces. And the other one looks over and it says something. And you see the subtitles and it says, fuck. <laughs> but yeah, that's one of the reasons why. That's that's the main reason why this film takes a spot on my, one of my, of one of my favorite horror films is that scene alone. So, yeah, I'll just to finish off, just to completely finish off Critters here, it's a really fun film. I definitely recommend that horror fans, and even movie fans, just like a fun time, check it out. 
or you should at least give it one watch, I would definitely say, yeah, if you're a fan of horror B films, I'd definitely say at least give this film one watch. I really don't think you'll be disappointed, and uh, I'd like to also say you should definitely check out the sequel, but unless you really want to see them, I would, I would say stay away from Critters 3 and 4. Uh, just to jump into the second film here, uh, for 28 Days Later, this is a film I highly recommend. This is a great film. I, re I love this film. I, I watch this film all the time. I even don't think the sequel's that bad. But, but to jump straight into the film itself, it's directed by Danny Boyle, who's a director I like. He always brings a lot of great style to his films, and in my opinion, a lot of substance as well. He's one of the directors, in my opinion, that can balance style and substance uh, most of the time. There's a great scene in the film where this fucking crow uh, is it, uh, has the infectious disease in it. Uh, or no, this uh, the crow's like pecking at this body and it has an infectious disease in it and the father is underneath it and the blood like falls out of it and goes straight into his eyeball. It's a really great directed scene, just the way the blood falls, like the little blood droplet lands straight in his eye. It's a terrific scene and when they got like blow him away, the father, because now that he's infected, um, it's just really heartbreaking and the scene is put together so well. I recommend you check this film out. I also recommend you even check out the sequel. I do like the sequel as well. It's not on the same level as the first film, but I still think it's very enjoyable, and I definitely recommend that you check it out. But uh, the film stars Cillian, uh, or Killian Murphy, uh, who's an actor I really enjoy. He's also in uh, he's also in Batman Begins and Dark Knight and uh, Dark Knight Rises, which uh, I'm a big comic book fan, so it automatically gives him bonus points for me. But I think he delivers a really good performance in this film. I also think he delivers a really good performance in the film Sunshine as well, also directed by Danny Boyle. But uh, yeah, the reason this film places on the, uh, I mean the reason this film is on my 69 favorites list is because it's just, just at the time it came out, I don't think there was like a lot of great horror films like coming out uh, exactly around that time. And then when this film came out, I think this was one of the much better horror films that came out around that time period in my opinion. And just once again, I just think it balances the style and the substance extremely well. And uh, just the way the film is shot, just with like uh, London like being deserted and nobody there, just gives such a great apocalyptic feel. Um, and the rage virus idea in the film of being affected with rage and kind of being in constant rage and just wanting to fucking kill people <laughs> if, you get, if you get this uh, virus, it's just... Uh, just an idea that really hits home with people, I think, or with me anyway. It just makes sense to me that the world would be would be wiped out in some kind of man-made virus, much more than some kind of like supernatural apocalypse. So I think this film just for that just has like a really spooky feel to it and a really creepy feel, like uh, just for that idea alone, which makes it much more real and creepier for that, uh, uh, much more real and creepier than a lot of other apocalyptic films I would say I've seen is what I'm trying to say and the scene where he uh, where uh, Killian Murphy goes home and sees his parents there laying dead is just just they're laying there dead in their bed it's just a heartbreaking scene and I just think he delivers a great performance I definitely recommend that fans of his check this film out and fans of Danny Boyle check this film out I really don't think you'll be disappointed um, I really don't think this film needed a sequel at all but I can understand why they made one I really don't think it needed a sequel, but I still think the sequel holds up pretty decently. Uh, I don't know why there isn't a third film in this franchise yet. I really think this is a franchise that needs a final film uh, to cap it off, to make it into a trilogy. I really think this is a franchise that needs a 28, mo a 28 months later film. But uh, just to finish off with 28 Days Later, it's just this film has a uh, really well done feel of loneliness in it and sadness. I just don't think a lot of other horror films or films in general have ever been able to recapture. And that's why this film places, uh, and that's why this film has a place on my 69 favorite horror films because every now and then, who doesn't like a little sadness? But that's not to say that the film is completely hopeless because I think the end of the film uh, is, a, is, a, is a good ending for the film because it provides hope for the future with all the infected dying off of starvation and everything. So just with that ending alone, it's like humanity's breakdown, but humanity coming back from the horrible thing that has happened to them at the same time, or at least starting to towards the end of the film, or at least giving hints at it. And I just think that ending ends the film perfectly, and that's the reason I really don't think you need a sequel to this film. It's because it's such a tight film and so well done and put together. 
it just doesn't it just I, I just never needed a sequel but the fact that we got one it could have been a lot worse than what it was um uh, and i'm glad it turned out as good as it did but yeah just to end this for 28 days later this is a franchise i would love to see a third installment in now it's time to jump into the classic here <laughs> with the original texas chainsaw massacre which in my opinion is not just one of my favorite films or favorite horror films ever made I also think it's one of the best horror films ever made. Definitely in the top five. Um, I love this film. Um, I watched this film when I was a teenager. Um, or a preteen, I would say. This film scared the shit out of me. <laughs> this film is really fucking intense. Despite the fact that there's no blood or really, or really like barely any blood in the film. Definitely not any gore or any to name or any to write home about, but the film just makes up for it, and just is so intense, just with the style of the film that's done in, just with the look of the film, and just with the character of Leatherface, played by Gunnar Hansen, just how fucking creepy he is, and like, he can just sit down, and just be looking straight into the camera, and just like, moving his tongue, and his mouth, or whatever, it's just like, so fucking creepy, he just brings that role home, in my opinion, the best Leatherface, and Jim Sidow as the cook, he's great, and the fucking hitchhiker to help round out the family, the crazy motherfucking hitchhiker. The family of killers in this film is great. This is the, this is the best uh, family of killers in any of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre films, in my opinion. And just the uh, the characters, uh, the character of Sally, she just seems like an average everyday girl. And uh, I think, and you really root for her in the film, or at least, or uh, yeah, you really root for her in the film because of all the fucking shit she has to put up with. With the, the the fucking the chainsaw massacre family, and like all the torture, and you got like this scene where she's at the dinner table, and the camera like focuses directly in on her face and her eyes, and her eyes are like moving around and around, and it's just so fucking intense. And and the scene at the end when she takes off running, and uh, Leatherface is taking off after her with his chainsaw, it's just just epic, just epic, baby. You just don't get no better than this film, in my opinion. Uh, Toby Hooper is is a director who I don't think is that good. Uh, this film right here is pretty much um, the best film he's ever done, and in my opinion, ever will do. Even though Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 is pretty decent, uh, this film is is better, and in my opinion, this is the only really amazing film he's ever done. Which, you know, isn't too bad. If you're going to just do one really great, if you're just going to do, uh, I mean, it's better just to have one really great film than the whole list of just like, just shit, in my opinion. And uh, this film right here is just is just so good, and just uh, I love the '70s like setting of it and look of it, um, and just like the uh, uh, real vibe to it. Like this film feels like it actually did happen, despite the fact that it didn't. I know a lot of people that actually thought this film was a, a complete true story, and I had to explain to them that it wasn't, and they always look at me weird, like, huh? <laughs> But uh, it's just the reason people think that is because this film is like so fucking good and just shot uh, and just well not and just shot in such a real looking style just with the low budget of the film and the real grainy style of it just adds an extra element to this film that in my opinion has never been captured ever again in horror films of uh, of of ever uh, any horror film I don't think it's ever been captured again at least in the horror films I've seen and especially not of the horror films today. Uh, in my opinion, if filmmakers want to make a truly intense horror film, they need to take note of this motherfucker right here. I mean, this film is so good, it makes you think that you see blood even when you don't. That's how good this film is, that it makes your mind actually think that you see blood in the film when there really is no blood in, the, in that scene. But, but yeah, just to finish off with Texas Chainsaw Massacre here, um, if you want a more in-depth review of the film, uh, just check out my review of the film. We, uh, I did reviews for the whole franchise, but uh, this film is easily the best film in the franchise, hands down. I love this film. Um, to be honest, though, this film still scares the fuck out of me, uh, even today. <laughs> uh, just because it still feels real of today, and I think this is a film that honestly benefits better from watching it on an old VHS copy than watching it on a Blu-ray. Just because, um, just because uh, the Blu-ray just tries to make things. Or uh, makes the picture look a little bit too clear and takes away a little bit of that uh, old grainy quality that you just can't capture on a more crystal clear Blu-ray. But yeah, just to finish off with Texas Chainsaw Massacre here, I love this film. And uh, if you're a horror fan, 
I'd recommend check this out, but chances are you've seen it already anyway. To demonstrate it in the next film here, I got uh, 30 Days a Night, which uh, is not just a, a good vampire film, but uh, also a, a good graphic novel, a good comic book. If you happen to be a comic book fan, as well as a horror movie fan, I definitely recommend checking out the comic that this film is based off of. But for the film itself, I think it has a really terrific idea with the fucking vampires going into Alaska, uh, where it's obviously dark, you know, for 30 days, which is a terrific idea for a vampire film, which is one that I'm really surprised that had it had it been done earlier, which is a re uh, which is a reason that this film is is one of my favorites, uh, also one of my favorite vampire films, because just the idea of a 30 days a night film where vampires are trying to kill like a whole town or wipe out a whole town. Um, it's just a terrific idea and something I really don't uh, understand why it took so long for someone to come up with. But I'm glad they did because otherwise we wouldn't have a good comic book and a good movie out of it. Uh, Josh Hartnett stars in the film. Um, Josh Hartnett, he's an actor that, uh, that I enjoy, but I don't think he's a very good actor. I think he has good charisma, though. I mean, he's a decent actor. He's he's really likable, though, is what I'm trying to say. But uh, this is one of his better films, in my opinion. Um, I really think he holds up pretty good in this film, and just the design of the vampires in this film with the more like feral approach to the vampires. Uh, I just really love in a in an area in time when a bunch of uh, shitty Twilight movies were starting to hit the cinemas. Uh, this film is a breath of fresh air, or was a breath of fresh air for me, uh, just because with vampires, the characters of vampires being destroyed by movies like Twilight. Um, I just feel like that this movie right here. It's just a hope that uh, <laughs> that uh, people will come to know vampires more as uh, the, uh, the savage killers and less like uh, little pansy pussies who sparkle all the time. <laughs> but yeah, this is a great film. This is a really good, really good film. I recommend uh, checking out if you're a vampire movie fan or if you're a horror fan. It's a lot of fun. Um, I don't really have a lot of problems with this film. Uh, as it is, I think it's a, a, a really good movie. I don't think it's a great movie, and I don't think it'll ever be considered a vampire classic or a horror classic. I think for the time it came out, it was one of the better horror films in the uh, in the year that it came out. Um, and yeah, I really enjoy the film. I also really like the comic. Stay away from the sequel if if you if you really enjoy this film like I do. Uh, whatever you do, do not watch the direct-to-DVD sequel. It is utter shit, which is a shame because a film that like this that I really enjoy, I would hope that it would have a good sequel. Even if it was direct-to-DVD, there's always that hope that might turn out well. But no, the sequel to this film is utter shit. So if you haven't seen it yet, stay away. You've been warned. <laughs> but, you know, check it out if you want to. But in my opinion, the sequel to this film is just utter shit. But this is a really good film. It's really fun. You got um, you got good gore in the film, uh, and the va and like I said, the vampire look, like the feral vampires, is something that I enjoy. Just the savage beast vampires, and the ending with Josh Hartnett, where he has to like inject himself with some of the vampire blood to uh, try to save the last people left, um, so he can fight the head vampire one on one. It's just uh, was just a cool idea. I thought. And uh, the ending of it, I think, is really epic and sad at the same time, where uh, he's getting, uh, he's basically getting, he lets himself be disintegrated <laughs> into fucking ash in the, by the sun at the end of the film, now that he's a vampire. I guess he doesn't want to go on being a vampire, so after he pretty much saves the day, he dies. So in that, in my opinion, that's just a, an epic ending right there, and just the way it's shot and the way it's done with the scene, that alone um, makes me like this film. Uh, <laughs> a lot, but just to cap this film off, this is a really fun vampire film. I wouldn't say it's one of the top five or top or even top ten best uh, vampire films. Well, I would say it might be in somewhere in the top ten, but towards the bottom. Instead, I don't think this film is a horror classic, but I think it's a really fun horror film within itself. In space, no one can hear you scream. That's right, motherfuckers. It's alien. <laughs> Uh, this for me right here is one of my all-time favorite horror films as well as one of my all-time favorite science fiction films. Uh, just the design of the creature of the alien itself uh, is just amazing to me. Uh, and just the idea of the alien itself, how it goes from an egg to a face hugger to a chest burster to an alien. 
or Xenomorph if you prefer to call it. Just that whole lifespan is just that's just really cool. Uh, just the the whole like uh, dark feel of this film and um, just like the whole dark feel of this film and with the characters and the one they're in space and one of the fucking face huggers like attaches itself to one of the crew members. Then you get that iconic scene for the first time where you think everything's okay and he's at the dinner table and uh, the fucking uh, the chest burster bursts out of his chest. That right there is enough. That scene alone in this film is enough for me to rank this film as one of the best sci-fi films ever made. Um, the only thing I can think of that really hurts this film is that for when it goes into slasher mode with the alien, when it's in a when it's full size, uh, it gets a little bit a uh, little bit cliched. It's got a little bit. It's got some cliches in it, like where one of the characters goes off to check on the cat, and the alien comes down and kills him. Um, that's a little weak. But other than that, I think this film holds up incredibly well. I love this film. I don't think this film has aged bad at all. In my opinion, this is uh, not only a horror classic but a sci-fi classic. Just the dark mood of the film. Uh, I don't think I don't think the mood of this film is uh, uh, has ever been captured really in uh, any dark style sci-fi films uh, of today. Which I really don't think there are really any really good dark sci-fi films of today. At least none that I have seen. It doesn't even seem like they even try to make that many. Which I can kind of understand why the quintessential one right here has already been made, Alien. <laughs> and that's what I like about the sequel also, Aliens, which goes in a completely different style with a whole action style. Uh, more action fun style to it. But just uh, to focus on this film right here, this is a great film um, with a great creature design. This is when the xenomorph is actually scary, or when the alien creature is actually scary. And just the title, Alien Alone, it's so simple. But it works so well for the film, just because it's such a simple title. There's, I mean, no reason to go more, uh, no reason to come up with some big, convoluted, overly done, stylish title. Just the title, Alien, just says says it all. It says it all for the film. Um, but yeah, just to finish this off, to cap off with the film Alien here. I love this film. I own this film. I own the Alien quadrilogy uh, Blu-ray set. Uh, in my opinion, that's the best uh, version of this film to get. Or the best version of the films to get if you're a sci-fi fan or, or at least an alien fan. Um, I really don't think the creature uh, that's designed in this film is. Uh, I mean, it's so unique. I really don't think it's ever uh, that there's ever been another space monster. Um, I mean, I don't think there's been a, another space monster in a in a movie in recent years that's been made in space that's ever like design-wise the creatures uh, in the movie that's ever came close to the fucking uh, creature of this film. And just like the whole, the whole life cycle of the creature in the film, and the whole like how you can't get it off someone the person's face is attached to, you can't get the face sucker off because fucking it bleeds acid. It's just such a such a unique idea at the time, and this film is shot like and I mean it has such a like a, a good you know really cool style to it that you just don't see in, in many films today or, or just filmmakers today just can't capture like really Scott could with this film. And Ridley Scott is also a director that I really enjoy, despite the fact that I didn't think Prometheus was that great, and I don't think Prometheus will ever be as remembered as this film, just to throw that out there. <laughs> That's my little rant on Prometheus slightly there. Even though I don't hate Prometheus, I still don't think it ever comes close to capturing the magic of this film, or even the sequel to this film. I don't think it's anywhere near as good as the sequel to this film either. But yeah, in my opinion, for the Alien franchise, um, watch this film, watch the second film, uh, fuck everything else. The first two films, in my opinion, are the franchise. There's no real reason to, uh, to even watch any of the films after one and two, despite the mixed results of the other films. This is a great film, and it has such a great claustrophobic feel to it that, once again, is just not, just I don't think has been captured again in horror films or sci-fi films of today. So all in all, this is a terrific film. I'll say I'll go more in depth with it uh, when I do my review for the Alien franchise in the somewhere in the next uh, year or two. But just to end, uh, just to end my little uh, joyful talk about Alien here, this is a terrific film, and uh, the, you might think the title Alien sounds generic. Uh, it sounds a little generic, just the title Alien, like it's not really catchy. But if you actually see the film, 
I think you'll think the I think you'll if you think that that the title is generic, I think if you actually see the film, you go back and realize how the how cool the title really is. That it's so simple, but sums up the movie in just one word, baby. And any film that can usually do that is definitely worth checking out. But yeah, any film with a simple title like that, with a title that doesn't have to go like a so convoluted and try to be like a so epic to catch your eye to catch your eye or whatever. Um, I think automatically means the movie's worth checking out because I think it means that the filmmaker usually is trying to provide something that's more of a good film instead of a film that's just going to be usually maybe flashy or uh, just a monster movie in space because even though that this film is pretty much a slasher film in space I think it works uh, so well that it's just a genre classic and a sci-fi classic that in my opinion uh, is the quintessential slasher film in space that will has never been topped and in my opinion I don't think ever will ah uh, tremors baby yeah now I'm on to another favorite horror film from my childhood. I wouldn't really call this film a horror film. It's more of a straight up horror comedy. And it's it's so hilarious. Uh, I think the cast in this film is great. Fred Ward, Kevin Bacon, Michael Gross. Just those three actors alone are uh, my three favorite characters of this entire franchise. Uh, I love this movie. I watched this movie more than probably just about any other horror film when I was a kid. Plus it's just so much fun and just such an original idea with the with the killer underground monsters. Although the creature on the actual poster in the box of the film uh, actually looks different than the actual uh, creature in the film. And I also think it's funny that the original title for this film I believe was fucking Sand Shark. Which in my opinion, thank god they changed it to the title Tremors which is a much catchier and better title in my opinion. And uh, also, just the characters in the film, like uh, Val and Earl, just Kevin Bacon and Fred Ward, uh, they just have such uh, great chemistry together. And uh, just the comedy that comes from them flows so well. And Michael Gross is a uh, fucking Burt Gummer in the film, and like the gun-toting character. Uh, he's so funny. The only wink link in the cast that I can spot is probably Reba McIntyre, who's not absolutely horrible, but really doesn't have any reason to really be in this film. I mean... They could have casted someone else. It seems like they kind of just casted her on name value a little, which I understand. I mean, filmmakers do that all the time. But um, but still, I really think that she's the only wink link of the film, like acting-wise and charisma-wise. She's not horrible. She's okay. I just think out of all the cast, I think she's the weakest link. Uh, the actual creature itself, all, another thing I find funny is that a lot of people call the creatures in the film tremors when they're actually called graboids. Which even that name is unique, and this film is just like such a tri such a good little tribute to old like a uh, style B films from back in the day that I just love it, and just the comedy in it works so well, and the horror in it um, works like just so well with it. I wouldn't say the film is scary, but it's just fun. It's just so much fun. I wouldn't even say it's graphic. Like I said, it's just it's just fun. Um, there's not a lot of yeah, like I said, it's not very graphic. There's not a lot of gore in the film. But just the coolness of the way the creature looks and just the unique idea of it coming up from under the ground and just Kevin Bacon and fucking Fred Ward's charisma in the film as the leads. Just uh, that just works wonders for this film. This film just has a magic about it that even though I love Tremors 2, I just don't think that the magic of this film was ever completely recaptured again uh, in this franchise. But this film is, is a terrific film, and I recommend it to anybody who's a fan of horror, or anybody who's a fan of comedy, really, or just movies in general. Uh, I think this film will, will appeal to everybody, not just horror fans, but movie, fa movie, but movie fans in general. Uh, yeah, you don't have to be a horror fan to enjoy this film. Uh, I think most people will enjoy this film just for the cast, to be honest. Um, the film, just with like with the characters, it just they, they get such good dialogue in it, just like... They're trying to think up names to name the creature because they discovered it, so they want to name it. And they like go through names, and one of the characters is like Snakeoids or something like that. And just that that comedy, just the way it's written, it's very intelligent. And uh, this, in my opinion, this is one of the best horror comedies ever made. Um, if not, well, it's my personal favorite horror comedy ever made. And I would say that it is one of the one of the best horror comedies ever made. I love this film. Uh, and I also really enjoy the sequel. Tremors 3 and 4, they're just okay films, but this film right here will always be the number one uh, <laughs> fucking classic for me in the, the horror comedy genre anyway.
And even in horror films in general, this film right here, I still think, holds up extremely well and is definitely one of the best in the genre ever made. It may not be one of the exactly, well, it may not exactly be one of the top 10 best horror films ever made, but, it's de but it definitely is one of the top best horror films ever made, in my opinion. But I do think it definitely is one of the, one of the top 10 best horror comedies ever made. And one of the most enjoyable movies that I have seen, really, to be honest. Just uh, like I've said multiple times, the cast alone in this film just, just gelled together so well that there's not a lot of other movies with a lot of other casts that just fit together just so well. This film, um, it just gels so great. The cast gels with the creature so good that I recommend that you, if you're a horror fan and you want to just have a fun time, I recommend that... Uh, you sit at home on a uh, Friday night or a Saturday night, chill out, pop some popcorn, and enjoy this motherfucker right here. Now I'm jumping to Stephen King territory here. <laughs> this is one of my favorite Stephen King films. Uh, I have a blast with this film. Uh, I, even though Samuel Jackson is on the poster with John Cusack, Samuel Jackson isn't really in the film that much. But what, when he is in the film, though, he, he definitely brings... Uh, Brings his Samuel Jackson is to the film, even though you can, even though his character is more um, laid back and less over the top than Samuel Jackson normally is in movies. You just kind of get the idea that he's wanting to scream even when he's being quiet with this with the scenes that he is in in the film. But John Cusack really carries this film. Um, John Cusack is an actor I like. I think he does really good in this film, and uh, I really enjoy watching him in this uh, watching him in this film. Uh, Stephen King, uh, Haunted Hotel things are a trademark with Stephen King and <laughs> goes along with The Shining. And just John Cusack's character being stuck in the room 1408 in this film and all the crazy shit that keeps happening to him in the room is just so fun to watch. And just his performance where he's like a, an alcoholic since his uh, kid passed away. Just the way he acts because when he like flies off, he's like busting up the refrigerator because he thinks there is no alcohol in it. And he's like, I want my drink! <laughs> it's so funny. I get a kick out of that, and uh, I think the film, I don't really think this film is really, like, really scary, but I think it has a lot of creepy moments in it, like, just, a, I think it's more of, like, a little creep fest, and I think it works on that level, and it's got some really good spooky moments in it, and some really sad moments, like when John Cusack sees his dead daughter, uh, like her ghost, I believe, in the film, um, when he's in room 1408, which is, uh, you don't really learn why room 1408 is so uh, fucked up, but uh, you don't really need to. Uh, there's no need for that explanation in the film. The film works well without it. There's no reason to explain that it's cursed by the Satan or whatever the hell. So uh, I give it bonus points for that, for not coming up with some stupid explanation for why there's something wrong with the room. Um, but just the idea of it, of a person being trapped in a, like one room and can't and not being able to get out and all that. I just like ideas like that. Whenever it's a movie with like one character through most of the film and he has to carry it, um, I usually enjoy films like that if the actor is good enough to carry the film and the material is good enough to stretch out, uh, I mean to uh, work for the length of the film. Um, but yeah, I think John Cusack and the idea of this film both work for the simple, it is really a simple idea if you get down to it of just John Cusack being trapped in a haunted hotel room pretty much. But it's just done so well, I think. That, uh, that I think it works on pretty much all levels. I don't really have any complaints about this film, to be honest. Uh, I really enjoy this film. The only thing I have a little bit of complaints about is I would like a little bit more Samuel Jackson. And uh, also, the original endings I've seen on the DVD of this film, they all sucked. Uh, I, I prefer the, uh, the ending we get with John Cusack living. I, that's a much better ending. After everything he's been through, uh, in, I mean, after everything he goes through in this film, I just like it much better that he comes out on top at the end and ends up beating the hotel and managing to get out in a really cool way at the end when he fucking uh, realizes finally that everything that the hotel has been showing him is like hallucinations or pretty much possibly hallucinations. But he knows like uh, he knows that uh, so he, he knows that uh, the lighter he brought in with him or the alcohol that he brought in with him, I mean, is, is real. So he sets the hotel room on fire. And the fire department ended up busting him out. I just thought that was a really clever way and showed the character had some sense and finally realized that, you know, he needs to get the hell out of this room. And it's just so much fun watching him. Uh, well, I mean, he knows through it, obviously, that he needs to get out of the room. But I just think it's cool that it shows the character has brains enough to figure out an intelligent way to get out. But uh, it's just so cool watching John Cusack in the, in the film trying to figure out ways to get out of the room. Like he climbs up to the fucking vents and... Uh, 
you can't get out that way, and then he goes out the window, and you can't get out that way. It's just so much fun, and the film just has a creepy factor to it, like when he looks out the window and is like uh, hollering at the person over in the building on the other side and straight in front of him, uh, and it's uh, he's actually looking at himself, and then uh, he sees like a, a spirit or a ghost or whatever come up behind himself over there in the other building, and then he looks around, and the same ghost is right there. That's just so creepy and really good, and that's what elevates this film for me to one of the much better Stephen King adaptations. And I would definitely recommend, if you're a Stephen King fan or a horror movie fan, I definitely recommend that you check this out. And in my opinion, this film is better than the story it's based off of. Okay, now on here to my favorite killer animal film, or favorite creature feature. Um, I love uh, This is another film that I really love, that I watched when I was a kid, and still appeals to me very much today. Uh, just the idea of it, of a, a dad, like, taking the, his kid's pet alligator and fucking flushing it down the toilet and it mutating has such a goofy, fun, urban legend, like, style vibe to it that I just love. And having it, like, mutate in the sewers and turn into a giant killer alligator is just hilarious beyond belief, but also so cool and so much fun. And the effects for the alligator in the film look really good. And you get really cool shots and shit, like, when the alligator, like, breaks up into the, I mean, like, a, comes up through the ground, like fucking goes, comes up into the street of the city and just starts killing people in the city. Now, this film is so much fun. Um, I don't really have any problems with this film uh, at all. Once again, this is a film I really love and don't really have any problems with the film. The only thing I can think of is that like every now and then uh, I would have liked uh, more full body shots of the entire creature, but it's, a much, it's an older film. So they they probably didn't have enough effects to completely you know carry all the all the a bunch of well to completely carry a bunch of extra shots so they didn't have the money to do it a bunch of times. But what we do get with the creature though I think is really well done. And once again, this is another film in my opinion that is another testament to how much better practical effects are than CGI. Please filmmakers, watch this film, watch Critters, watch fucking Gremlins, and realize that CGI is okay used with touch-ups and enhancements but when it's overdone it just looks like shit it does it just looks like shit i love this film i don't want to see this film remade because if it was remade today uh the the, the fucking alligator would more than likely be cgi and it would turn out to just look like a cgi glob of shit uh the sequel to this film is shit uh don't waste your time with the sequel to this film but this first film right here alligator i think is as a classic for me and uh the killer animal genre uh, I love this film, and like I said, just the urban legend idea of it and the whole alligators in the sewers things. I mean, the whole alligator in the sewer thing is just that to me right there. Just uh, just from that alone, I think if you're a horror fan or a movie fan and you just read that idea alone, that that'll get you interested in watching this film. And it's a to me, it's a film about an alligator that ki mutates and kills people in the sewer and <laughs> kills people in the city. And it succeeds at doing that, and that's all I can, that's all I ask for from a film like this, and that's the reason why I love it, because it's so good at doing what it what it what it needs to do. Next up is one of not just one of my favorite horror films, but one of my favorite films in general. But I'm a big Christian Bell fan, so I might be biased, <laughs> but I think this is one of his finest performances and one of his best films. Uh, American Psycho. I haven't read the book this film is based off of, but I really want to check it out. Whenever I get a chance, this is a really terrific film. Um, just the ideas in this film I really enjoy. You don't even know if he's actually killing people or not because, well, you know in the film that sometimes when he says stuff, it's just stuff he's saying in his mind and he's like stuff he's really wanting to say, kind of like he represses it. Uh, and if you get really fun dialogue in the film, um, like, uh, like every time he gets ready to go out and do something bad, he'll tell a person that he's with that he has to go return some videotapes. Which I always think that's funny. Like in, towards the end of the movie, he's like with Reese Witherspoon, and he's like, he looks there and he's like, I have to go return some videotapes. <laughs> like after he tells her that he doesn't want to marry her, uh, I, uh, just that dialogue alone I think is funny. And just like this movie has a lot of great ideas in it. Like uh, all the characters are like yuppie type people, and they're all like trying to trying to adhere to some kind of like a superficial, I guess, uh, lifestyle or some. Some like high society lifestyle, so they all look like clones of each other. Every one of them pretty much looks like the exact same guy. They got like almost the exact same hairstyles, like slick back hair and stuff. Uh, and what's funny is in the film of the, they can't even like they people can't tell them apart. 
like Christian Bell's like I'm Patrick Bateman and they think he's somebody else because he, all his friends look so much alike and uh, not just that but his own friends can't even tell that who he don't even know his name half the time because they think he's uh, it's just one of the other guys they don't even know his name because everybody looks so much alike um, and just like whenever like he kills somebody in the film he always uh, plays music the character does Patrick Bateman and it's just so funny because he plays like a uh, hip to be square and he <laughs> It is uh, just the scene of Christian Bell hacking uh, Jared Leto, the, who's also the lead singer of 30 Seconds to Mars, which is a band I think is decent. Uh, just the scene of uh, Christian Bell hacking him to, to death with an axe while listening to Hip to Be Squire playing in the background is just hilarious. And I definitely recommend for Christian Bell fans that you check this film out. This film has great social commentary on like the yuppie lifestyle and people like that. And you get William Defoe in the film to provide tension as a as a cop, but uh, you don't even know if he's actually real or if he's just somebody like Patrick Bateman's character is hallucinating. And that alone right there, and just how well it's played in the film, uh, makes me give this film a high recommendation. It's one of my favorite films, uh, not just in the horror genre, but in films in general, like I've said. I really enjoy this film, and I definitely recommend that you check it out. It is great social commentary, and it's also an extremely fun horror film.